Hi, and welcome to this episode of HR and Cocktails. Welcome to the Speak Easy. Today I have with me Cheryl Brown of Davis Agnor Rappinport and Scalney. She is an attorney. Welcome, Cheryl. Thank you, Kimberly, for having me. Of course, of course. So today we're going to talk about employment laws, um, how they impact employers, things that they should be considering. So that's what we're talking about today. So many things. So many things. So many things. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So, Cheryl, today we're going to talk about employment laws, lots of things going on in the world of employment, and for um, businesses to know, various things that are happening in the world. So tell us a little bit about Davis, Agno, Rappaport, and Scowney. Oh, thank you. Um, we're a mid-sized law firm in Columbia, Maryland. We represent primarily business owners. Um, so I head up the labor and employment practice and everything that a business owner needs from hiring to firing and everything in between. The law firm also has a practice area in estate planning, succession planning, community associations, family law, and litigation. But we really are a full-service law firm for business owners. Yes, definitely. I think that I've leveraged your services in about three or four of those categories. <laughs> yes. Yes. But before we get into specifically what employers need to know right now, let's get a drink. What drink would you want? Oh, my favorite is a caramel apple martini because it's fall. Oh, uh, yes, because it's fall. So yes. a caramel apple martini coming up. Thank you. All right, Cheryl, so you chose a caramel apple martini. Yes. Yes, and I had never had one before. I've never made one before, so I had to look it up and come up with the ingredients, and of course, I had to try it out yesterday. Of course, <laughs> of course. So you it's chose it, yes, because fall. Is my favorite time of year. Yes, fall, yes, awesome. So we're gonna get started. We're gonna start with some apple cider, so make sure you shake it. And we're gonna start with three parts apple cider. Um, so you just put it right into your shaker. And that'll make parts. two glasses. This will make two glasses because okay. I'm using the larger side. You can use the smaller side to make one. Okay. You're so smart. I'm so smart. I know. <laughs> and then caramel vodka, which I hadn't had before. It's pretty tasty. It gives I know. It a I good, told you about that. It's yes, really good. You did. And I had not tried it. So we'll do two parts of caramel vodka right into our shaker. And then we're gonna add a little bit of apple vodka and vanilla vodka, but just a little bit, like a half part, because they are both very strong and can take over the drink. So you really just wanna do a little bit just to add a little bit of flavor, so not too much of either of those, like a half. Because <laughs> you can smell that apple vodka oh, I over can. here. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty it's strong, good. yeah. And the vanilla vodka. It's a lot of vodka. <laughs> just the, I like just vodka. The, I, know. I know. You do. I do. <laughs> so half part of the vanilla vodka. So we're putting it right in there. Then we're going to add ice. And then Cheryl, do you want to shake it? Sure. you want to give it a shake? If I can get it in there and not splash it all over us. All right. So we're going to just add some ice. Get it nice and cold. And while you're doing that, uh, we're going to garnish. So while she's shaking, I'm going to garnish. So we have... Caramel, Caramel sauce, yes, and brown, brown sugar. sugar. Yes, yeah, so if you hand me the glasses, sweet enough. we cannot. So if you can hand me the glasses while you shake, I will garnish. Awesome, and so I'm just gonna dip it in the caramel sauce and the sugar, so. I'm a natural bartender. Yes, I see that. Not really, but. <laughs> I see that. Ooh, that's nice and cold. I know. Okay. All right, okay, so I'm gonna just give this another dip oh, in the beautiful. caramel. Isn't it pretty? That's really pretty. I know. And then we're going to dip it in the sugar. Brown sugar is tricky, though. Yeah, see, I never take the time to garnish. You have to. That makes the drink. All right. So now, yep. And then just pour. Awesome. All right. Very good. You're so precise. <laughs> Well, maybe you, right. get, you get a little more. No, you'll wanna, get a little more, too. Skip. There's two I don't want to skip. You're good. You're good. Okay. All right. Oh, that and looks perfect. It does. It looks great, actually. All right. And then we're going to okay. top it with some sliced apples that we sliced. And hopefully they stay on top. They did. Yay. <gasps> they stayed on top. Isn't that beautiful? 
I know. Look how beautiful. Yay. All right. Cheers. cheers. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, definitely. Oh, this looks beautiful. Mm. It looks beautiful. It tastes beautiful. Mm. Honestly. Yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> I had to get another That's sip. That's a good choice. Yeah, it was if a I good choice. So if you say so, yes, if exactly. I, say so myself. I had to get another sip. Um, I know. <laughs> actually, I'm going to wipe my hands a little bit because the drizzle came down. So, Cheryl, you and I do a lot of things um, in Maryland, specifically around employment law. Lots of things have come down the pike in Maryland. There are some things that are coming down. Um, Federally. So what are some things that if you had to talk to a small business owner, let's talk about one thing to start. What are what is one thing that you would start with that, you know, a small business owner, a medium business owner, size business owner needs to know? So at the federal level, should we start there? Sure. So I think that the top concern of business owners at the federal level would be probably the non-compete laws. Um, in addition would be the I-9 updates, which you are very familiar with. Yes. And then the most recent occurrence out of the Department of Labor would be the proposed increase in the salary threshold for overtime. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. So let's go to um, non-competes. Okay. Yeah. Let's start there. So I always look back at the the landscape of non-competes nationwide. And nationwide, um, just from a federal level, I think courts, Department of Labor, the FTC, they kind of frown upon non-competes. And business owners, I mean, we like non-competes because it protects your confidential information. It protects your clients and customers, and that's something that you know in Maryland we can still do at a state level. So when we see that the federal government is looking to ban all non-competes across the country, it makes everybody a little nervous. So right now, um, when we speak with our clients, like I said, we know that in Maryland that you can still do non-competes, but we really look at what is an employer trying to protect if it's their confidential information, their clients and customers, their employees, there's other ways that they can implement those protections, you know, from a non-solicitation, a confidentiality agreement, non-disclosure. And we can really speak with them about what that looks like. Yeah. And I think that it's interesting because you have those um, businesses that have they want to have every agreement under the sun in place for their employees. Yeah. And then yes. you have some that have nothing. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, so you you didn't say that they couldn't go work directly for your competition. Or you, they, you, they, you didn't say they couldn't take your clients with right. them when they left. Right. Right? Yeah. So, A, it's kind of the balance of getting some of those employers to understand that you do need to put some things in place. Right? right. Whether it's, to your point, a non-solicitation. Um, I mean, maybe not a non-compete if that's not applicable, depending on the type of mm -hmm. organization it is, but non-disclosures um, and, and, and non-solicitations at a minimum, because at the end of the day, if that person is skilled in a particular thing, they're probably right. going to go do that thing right. somewhere else. Right. Yeah. And I think with the non-competes, you have to also define it so specifically. Like, what are you really trying to keep your employees from doing? So when you have that conversation with business owners and look at those non-competes, you know, after understanding what it is, you may decide that we can have a confidentiality agreement and that's all we need, mm -hmm. you know, because you shouldn't keep an employee from trying to get another job. We can't have any restraint on employment, but you do want to protect your information and customers and clients? When I think of a non-compete, I typically think of sales positions. Mm -hmm. So what other types of roles would someone need to even consider? Because, you know, every role is not a non-compete role. Like if I'm, you know, um, a server at a restaurant, that's not a non-compete type of role necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. No, and um, Maryland actually addressed that just recently at the legislature, and they did increase the salary threshold or the wage threshold as to which workers, you know, can have a non-compete. It, it used to be tied to um, anybody le who made less than $15 an hour is not covered by a non-compete. They just increased that. So October 1st, it's going to go into effect, and then... 
It'll, again, increase when minimum wage increases in Maryland. So all those workers who make less than that threshold will no longer be subject to any type of non-compete, which, is, to your point, would be restaurant workers or, you know, workers in, you know, probably in hospitality and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. The people, you're right, sales um, is definitely one area. Um, if you really want to, you know, people in the uh, – biotech space. Mm -hmm. um, they're mm -hmm. trying to protect their trade secrets and confidential mm -hmm. information. Um, medical professionals, they are always trying to protect their clients and customers. Mm -hmm. They they are advocating at the federal level to make sure that non-competes aren't just banned just across the board. You can't treat mm -hmm. every industry the same as we mm -hmm. know. Um, you have to kind of look at each industry and they'll have their own lobbyist. But to, to your point that. though, like to, for the example of, you know, a tech professional, that's intellectual property. Right. So that's kind of a, mm -hmm. another area of protection that not, might not necessarily need to be completely solved under a non-compete. Right. And then to the medical professional, um, a non-solicitation, like you cannot solicit our client. So that's something mm -hmm. else that doesn't necessarily have to be under a non-compete. So there, to your point, there are various ways that you can address right. these things that don't necessarily have to fall under a non-compete, which... In all fairness, you know, 15, 20 years ago, it would be like, you can't do this thing anywhere for, mm -hmm. you know, two years. And it's like, then I can't work, right? right. Uh, right. So, so there was a need to pull in the reins on employers, right. but now mm -hmm. the pendulum seems like it's swinging completely to the other direction. Right. And there has to be some type of happy medium so that businesses can continue to do business, but that employees can continue to, to right. work. Yeah. I do want to add one thing. So in the impatience, I think, of the federal government passing anything or the FTC, you know, their proposed rulemaking passing, the National Labor Relations Board um, general counsel just issued an opinion that said that the National Labor Relations Board is going to look at the legality of non-competes. And they believe that non-competes violate employees' protected concerted activity. So if... and. The NLRB, you know, NLRA, the National Labor Relations Act, does cover private employers yeah, as well yeah. as those employers with unions. And so if you're part of an investigation and it's related to the NLRB, yeah, you have to be worried that that non-compete will be scrutinized by them. Yeah, so um, the NLRB... Um, I would classify, <laughs> yeah, you know where I'm going with this. Um, Do we need another drink? I, I mean, know, maybe I need we a know, stiff okay. drink, yeah. yeah. Um, the NLRB is a bit of a busybody. And so they've kind of decided to insert themselves in a lot of places. And I get mm -hmm. that they cover private employers. I, th mm -hmm. That's not anything new, right? But it seems that they've been actively trying to broaden their influence and scope in private employers, mm -hmm. um, non-unionized employers. So um, I would be interested to see um, how far that goes. Well, they just they just came out with another ruling just yeah. to make your day and probably mm -hmm. have to make you another drink. Okay. But um, they are now scrutinizing employee policies, um, handbooks, anything that they believe restrains an employee's protected concerted activity. Um, so... Things like uh, non-disparagements, things like, right. um, I guess, some type of confidentiality agreement in an employee handbook, non-insubordination non, um, clauses, um, social media. We are now re-examining a lot of these policies to yeah. make sure that they continue not to restrain an yeah. employee's rights. Yeah, and I do get that. Yeah. So... Um, for any of our listeners that may not be familiar with the National Labor Relations Board or the um, National Labor Relations Act, um, many people think about it as um, the act and the organization that manages union relationships, but it right. does impact private employers to the extent mm -hmm. that, they're, they're, that they believe that it's impeding 
um, an employee or a group of employees' ability to engage in protected concerted activity, right. which in their mind will ultimately result in them unionizing and organizing. Right. That's right. Yeah, that's the... <laughs> it's right. really where yes. they're going with right. that, exactly. right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, and so, you know, we, we heard several years ago about you can't tell people not to discuss their salaries. Right. Um, and so I get... So, and many of us have taken the non-disparagement language out of severance agreements mm -hmm. and various other agreements mm -hmm. for those reasons. Um, you know, some of our social media policies, we did have to adjust and address. Um, so, I, 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 yeah, you know, those things are there. But at the end of the day, I do believe, though, that in just in my opinion, there is an over-regulation of employers in a variety of areas, not just in this area, but when we get to, you know, um, what types of benefits you offer your employees. And, you know, it's starting to be an over-regulation of that. But, um, yeah, so we'll see where this goes. See where we'll goes. see where that Absolutely. goes. Um, Absolutely. The beauty of it is... Um, uh, Cheryl and I um, have, you know, had many conversations, and I remember um, in March and April of 2020, we were doing several <laughs> presentations virtually. Right. Um, I don't know where you were in March um, and April of 2020, <laughs> <laughs> but um, we were doing presentations, and literally we'd be doing a presentation about um, the regulation, um, the pay regulation, and then we would get at the end of the conversation and a new a new arm of it had come out or something had changed. Right. And so we started saying, as of as of right now, as of, you know, 11, yeah, 29 right. a.m., yeah. this is what it is because right. it was changing so quickly. And quite honestly, the landscape of employment legislation is changing quickly. It can change right. from October to January to, to June or, you know, the, whatever those milestone dates mm -hmm. are that people like to um, implement regulations. Which is why I say I have the best practice area. Yes. Because it's constantly changing. <laughs> We're it, not bored. It, yeah, We're not exactly. Bored, right? Exactly. And, you know, we sit on a few committees on various mm -hmm. chambers and, you know, labor and employment is always the busiest committee because it's so much going on. Right. And I think, you know, typically the federal government does not move as quickly as mm -hmm. the state legislature. Right. And things usually get held up, and it's years before we see something that is passed, even if it's a proposed rulemaking or if Congress is passing, something like that. So at the state legislature, um, as Kimberly said, you know, we do a lot of advocacy, and um, we're following constantly the bills, but Maryland in particular does propose and implement a lot of mm -hmm. employment laws. Yes, they mm -hmm. do. And I know that one of the things that we are constantly wanting to happen in the state of Maryland is preemption, oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> which we know will probably not, not happen, happen, but no. we have to keep saying it. So preemption um, would not allow local jurisdictions to... Um, have legislation that's different than from the state. So right now we have various counties. So um, Baltimore City, Howard County, Montgomery County have some pieces of legislation that are different than the state, right? Mm -hmm. And so the preemption would make it where everyone would be the same, except I already know that Montgomery County would probably be able to jump over preemption at this yeah, point, probably. Know, yeah. So, um, but the, 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 but the beauty of that would be for employers, particularly small employers, they would not have to manage federal, state, local, um, right. you know, in that in that same way, particularly with the different definitions of small employer and different definitions of things, right? Right. So hopefully we'll be able to get our arms around it and make it a little bit easier to manage the legislative landscape. But in the meantime, call Cheryl. Um, <laughs> yeah. So you talked about the proposed rule. Mm hmm for salary. T tell our audience about that. What does that mean? So if we remember, I think it was 2016, um, the FLSA, um, Fair Labor Standards Act with the Department of Labor, increased the salary threshold for exempt employees. And exempt employees are different than non-exempt employees. Exempt employees are those employees who are exempt from overtime. And Part of being an exempt employee, you have to meet three tests, the duties test, the salary basis test, and the salary threshold. And in 2016, um, they increased that salary threshold to, 
and I should know the exact number, $35,565, I'll just say. Yeah. And I'll blame that on the cocktail. Yeah. Um, yes. But um, <laughs> that threshold has been, um, the department leader has proposed a new increase in that threshold, and they want to increase it possibly to up to 55000 Again, I don't know the exact number, but around there, which would make that most employees who fell below that salary threshold would be considered non-exempt subject to overtime. Mm -hmm. That's that's a in a nutshell. Yeah. And the last time they did it in the 11th hour at right. 11.59 p.m., mm -hmm. there was an injunction. There was. And many employers and many of the clients that I was working with had already made the conversion to mm -hmm the new status. So anyone right. who was below that threshold, I think it might be $615 a week. I think might be the threshold or something like that. Don't hold me to it. <laughs> um, and anybody who was under that, they had already converted them to non-exempt. And so... Those were the overachievers. The procrastinators were happy. <laughs> they were very because happy. Because they, they didn't were. have to implement anything. No, yet. they didn't. Um, right. So I know that, you know, right now they're in the proposed rule process... But even even still, you know, we have to be prepared that mm -hmm. there may be a jurisdiction that may want to take another look at it. But at the same time, though, I think prior to 2016, that number had not been looked at in, what, 30 years? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So I know it seems onerous to us that we're doing it again, what, six years later, seven years later. Mm -hmm. But I think that there is a need to look at it as wages increase, as people start to make more money. The state of Maryland, you know. Cost of living has it, increased. Exactly, yeah. because now we're going to $15 an hour. Um, in 2017, minimum wage was still, I think, nine seventy five yeah. or something like that, or ten fifteen or something. Well, and I think when they first looked at it, they wanted to put language in the bill that said they would reexamine it every three years. They also wanted to tie it to... Don't say it. Okay, I won't say yeah, it. No, yeah, I know what so you're going to say. Yeah. I know your consumer See, index. Cause, <laughs> I know, because <laughs> CPI. Yes. <laughs> Have a drink. Yeah. Um, no. So I think part of this new proposed rule does increase it, and it will, most likely it will be increased somewhere between, let's say, 35 and 55, whatever that looks like. And then... The other part of that role is, will they re-examine every three years? And then will they tie it to the CPI and have an automatic increase tied to that? Mm -hmm. So it's in, I think they're going to open it up for public comment. We'll see what happens. It probably won't, we won't know anything until next year. Yeah. We'll have to do another podcast. Yes, we will. Yes. Well, we need to do okay. this like every six months, yeah, honestly. Well, every six months, um, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, honestly, I can tolerate a review every three years versus an automatic increase tied to CPI. Right. Like, that's, I don't know how employers would be able to manage through how that. How they would budget. It, it, I mean, budget. Yeah, and then think about, you're reclassifying people at mm -hmm. what frequency, mm -hmm. like, that's a lot. That that that's a lot, and I get the intent, but the impact is going to be very very challenging to employers and and you know, to employees because there's yeah. employees who are exempt who may become non-exempt and they've never had to keep track of a timesheet or mm -hmm. overtime. They like to just be able to work whenever they want to and not yes. punch a clock. And and but, also to your point about yeah. punching the clock, there are people who almost see that as a status symbol as well. Right. The exempt classification and taking that away from them um, could impact. I mean, I know that that's not the right. legislators' no. No, no, um, no, no, concern, no. but it could also impact um, some morale. Right. To be honest. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so you also mentioned I nines. Oh, I nines. Yeah. So mm -hmm. talk to us about the I nines. Well, hopefully um, by now, uh, I would say everyone should be in compliance, but we know that that's really not the case um, because not everybody is up to date. Um, so the I-9s, and we actually do have a grace period until November 1st. So the easy, I guess, notification would be we have new I-9s that were issued and employers have until November 1st to start using the new I-9s, and after that, they'll be fined if they don't use the correct I-9. So mm -hmm. definitely download download the new I-9s. Mm -hmm. um, the second part of that, or 
that really is the more challenging part was that employers over COVID, going back to 2020 to 2023, if you were verifying I-9 documents virtually, which I would say most everybody probably did, Mm -hmm. you needed to go back and re-verify those documents physically because the basic requirement is that we physically inspect all I-9 documents. And if we didn't do that, we now need to go back and do that. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the simple answer. It is. And there's a lot of nuances to yeah. that, by the way. <laughs> right. Um, and one thing I will say, I actually recommend that organizations go to the USCIS website every time they do an I-9. Yeah. Just to make sure that they didn't tweak something and you didn't know about it. Because if you download I-9s into like a packet... You get into the habit of just using it. Right. I mean, we do I-9 audits on clients often, and I can't tell you how often I've seen some, like, 1990s I-9 still being used with, like, higher dates of the 2000s. Yeah, I think I-9s, an I-9 audit is probably the easiest way that they can find employers. Mm -hmm. I also think the easiest way is looking for their employment posters. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So if they do an audit, they're going to look for that. But I-9s... Everybody makes at least one mistake on a 99, and they find you per mistake. Yes, yes. they do. Yeah, they do. So. And I would also say with the employment posters, the most recent posters came out in June. So if you have not gotten an updated poster since June, get a new poster, please, mm-hmm. um, because there was an update to um, both federal and the state of Maryland. If you're in Maryland, there was an update to both of those. Um, so what other things should we be thinking about in the world? We could just talk forever, but what other things should we be talking about? Well, I think that we covered federal. If we wanted to talk about state, um, the paid family medical leave insurance, which Department of Labor in Maryland is uh, a new entity, a new commission. And, you know, fingers crossed, we should be hearing this fall, you know, what the contribution looks like and... You never know. So that that's always yeah a preview of <laughs> what's to come, and um, we'll see what happens. But the other, I think, big challenge for employers was the – I'm going to throw – I'm going to throw it out mm-hmm. – legalization yeah. of cannabis yep. and how that impacts the workplace. And in a way, it almost shouldn't. Correct. But I do think I get a lot of questions – from employers as to what that looks like. And yep. even to the point where the state has said, it's legal, don't worry about it. You don't even have to test for it. Mm-hmm. And in Maryland, we still test. It's still um, part of a panel, especially we have a lot of government contractors. Yes. Um, a lot of employees that are in uh, either whether it's safety sensitive positions, Mm -hmm. um, employers that deal with child care, deal Mm -hmm. with uh, health professionals. So yes, it's still a question that comes up. And what is it that employers have to do or how do they manage that? I agree. And one thing that I tell um, employers is that similar to what I told them during, you know, COVID, we don't need to make up new problems. And toxic, legal intoxicants exist. You can take legal prescriptions that Mm -hmm. could make you a bit, the technical term isn't intoxicated, but it's definitely the effect sometimes, depending on the type of drug, right? Under the influence of Under the influence, exactly. As I have a cocktail. Exactly, exactly. (laughs) Alcohol. So don't Mm -hmm. create new things. Right. And um, so, yeah, it's just an interesting thing. So... We could talk about this for hours, but there are a couple of things we're going to talk about in the after show. So what we will do is thank our guests for joining us today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Cheryl. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining this episode of HR and Cocktails.